Hey Don, dude, I went to the fair yesterday and I rode this ride that really changed my life. It's called the Gravitron. You go in there, the doors close, the lights go out, and it spins the heck out of you. Now, in that ride, it feels like all of my organs were pushed against my back and my entire body was slammed against the wall. Why was that so much fun? Why did I feel that way? Do you know? So a ride like the Gravitron works much like a centrifuge, where you have a few forces operating on your body as it's going. So for example, you have the angular velocity, which is the velocity on the inside, measured in meters per second, the speed that it's spinning. Then you have the tangential velocity, which is really tangent to the most important force, which is centrifugal force, which is why you feel all of your organs pushing into your back. Okay, but in this ride, I saw a little girl climbing up the walls. I was able to scoot forward a little bit. And along the way, I saw a big trucker dude slammed against the wall like he was never going to move again. Does this difference in size play an effect on anything? So, when you're dealing with objects of different mass, there's an equation for that, but the force they feel is equivalent to the mass times the radius times the angular velocity squared. So in the case of the little girl, because she had less mass, she felt less force on her body, allowing her to move, to move freely around. Whereas the larger guy had more mass, so he was feeling much more of the centrifugal force, centrifugal force in that case, pushing against his body, holding him back, not allowing him to move freely. Mm. Okay, so I guess that's how the centrifuge works over here. If you were to, say, put all three of us in a tube, it would kind of be like the components of a cell in a tube. And as you spin it, those with more mass would get more force exerted on them, and they'd be separated further than the smaller ones. So I'm imagining this being the Gravitron, each spot in here would be a person in there, and the radius in this case would be about six centimeters. As it spins, more force is exerted on the bigger particles. Exactly. So Wait up a second. I see on here you have an option. You have either times g or RPM. What if you only have one? What if you only have times g? And the formula we have for this is RPM. What would you do then? So if you do have either times g or RPM, so you can't actually solve for that other unknown. So in this equation, you have times g equals 1.118 times 10 to the negative fifth times the radius, which is six in our case that you measured earlier, times the RPM squared. So let's say you're trying to find times G because your protocol says spin at 10,000 RPMs, but you need, you only have a centrifuge that reads times G. So you times 1.118 times 10 to the fifth times the six centimeters, which is the radius in our case, times 10,000 squared. So the answer to that would be you can set the centrifuge to 6,708 times G. So, in a science environment, we wouldn't be spinning people, we'd be spinning cells, isolating the different components of the cells. So, say I've got the, I've got the whole cells, I've got DNA and I've got protein that I want to separate. I would just take them, using this little one for example, I would just throw them in there and let it go. Oh, what's happening? What's happening? Now, the problem that you ran into is that you didn't have a properly balanced centrifuge right there. So, for example, if you take four materials, two of which are at 10 grams and two of which are at 5 grams, setting them up like this would not work because they're not balanced. So, you'd get that rattling, the shaking, and depending on the size of the centrifuge, you could actually damage a machine worth thousands, thousands of dollars. 
down here is a better configuration. We have a 10 grams and a 10 grams opposite of each other, the 5 grams and the 5 grams opposite of each other as well. So the two forces cancel each other out. All right, so balancing is very important. I guess if I were to use that same technique I used on the little one, on this big expensive one here, I'd probably lose my job. Um, so looking in here, I see there's different adapters. I suppose that's what they're for, to help in the balancing. So we've got smaller tubes. We want to have them balanced to each other so it spins regularly. And the more I put in there, I have to balance everything so nothing bad would happen. Exactly. Okay, I understand. So an analytical centrifuge would be a smaller scale one like this. And a preparative centrifuge would be a bigger one like this. So you can centrifuge larger and more samples. So now there's actually different types of centrifuges based on what you need. It's analytical versus preparative. Analytical is usually used for smaller scale centrifugation for research purposes. So let's say you need to do a quick DNA isolation on a small sample you have. Now preparative is used at a much larger scale for, let's say an example, when you use a bioreactor, you have thousands of liters of material, they have large scale preparative centrifuges. So that allows you to harvest those goods that an industry would need for, let's say, example, a drug product or some type of vaccine. And another application is me spinning. You make me